Well, thanks for joining us tonight for KBU's Spring Pledge Drive Special Earth Day webinar. And tonight we're gonna to celebrate the victories of the Thin Green Line. It's, concerted, it's a concerted effort by activists across the region to prevent the Northwest from becoming a fossil fuel export hub. I'm Barbara Bernstein, host of Focus Focus, and I'm joined by some of the key people who along with hundreds of others have spearheaded the effort to hold a Thin Green Line to preserve what is best about our region. For those of you who listen to Locus Focus, you've heard every one of these people <laughs> at least once on my show. Our panelists for this webinar include Eric DePlace, who's director of the Thin Green Line at Sightline Institute in Seattle, Jay Julius, a fisherman father and proud Lummi Nation tribal member, Keila Farrell Smith, a Modoc Klamath artist and activist and board member of Rogue Climate, Diane Dick, a longtime community and climate activist in Cowlitz County in Southwest Washington, Claudia Regner, co-founder of Redefined Tacoma, and Elijah Cetus with Portland Harbor Community Coalition and the Brady River Campaign. And we'll start by reviewing our victories, and then we'll have a Q&A in a little bit in which we'll talk more about the challenges we still face in staving off future fossil fuel development, as well as positive actions we can take to achieve our goals. So we're going to start with Eric, who coined the term Thin Green Line, and uh, get his sense of kind of an overview of what this movement is really about. Uh, thanks, Barbara. I, I'm so grateful to be here on Earth Day with um, everyone uh, who's on the, the webinar today. For the last decade, it's felt like I've had this experience of walking among giants, and uh, and and about you know five of those giants are are on the call with us um, this evening, um, but there are many many others, and um, you know it's been it's been this really remarkable experience for me, um, you know, as somebody who's kind of who's born and raised in the Northwest um, in a region that has not historically mattered much to global politics, has not mattered that much to global climate change or to the energy economy. And that was true all the way up until about a decade ago. And if uh, one of the KBU producers could put up the first slide, I think it would help sort of illustrate um, kind of a couple of points that I'll make. But what happened about a decade ago is that there were these big tectonic shifts in uh, energy markets. And those shifts um, uh, changed the nature of the Pacific Northwest um, fundamentally. We went from a place that didn't really matter to a place that mattered tremendously uh, on, on the global stage. And so what this map is intended to depict are on the right hand side, these big carbon energy deposits um, shown in red, some of the biggest on earth, uh, the most you know dangerous to the climate um, deposits of fossil fuels that we can imagine. And on the left, some of the fastest growing energy markets, there are others um, in, in the world. And between them, this little strip of land between Prince Rupert, British Columbia and Coos Bay, Oregon. And it was on that strip of land, um, that strip of coastline, um, that it turned out that a, a meaningful chunk of the global climate debate would hinge. And this region that has not historically mattered, that has prided itself on clean energy, on innovation, uh, on at least a certain degree of environmental responsibility, all of a sudden was about to become a global superhighway for fossil fuels. Uh, we looked at seven proposals for new ex coal export facilities plus three expansions. We looked at at least two major oil pipelines. We looked at least at at least two major LNG export proposals, at least three or four, maybe five new petrochemical proposals, at least 15 oil by rail proposals. Uh, all of this stuff coming to our shores um, by some of the biggest industries uh, on earth at that time. Uh, and uh, if you go to the, the next slide, please. What I, what I did was try to do a little arithmetic, um, a little math to kind of illustrate the nature of what was coming to the Northwest at this time. Um, on the left-hand side is the carbon equivalent of the Keystone XL pipeline. So if you were to build the Keystone XL, um, pump all that oil through it at full capacity and burn all that oil, that's so how much carbon on the left-hand side you'd burn. Um, on the right-hand side are the new projects. This is a drastic underestimate uh, that were proposed for the Northwest. So that's natural gas by pipe, oil by rail, oil by pipe, coal terminals. You could uh, add on top of that many other things. And what we were wrestling with in the Northwest was at least five, uh, maybe as many as eight Keystone XL pipelines worth of carbon based fuel projects all coming to our shores. And so we had a, we had a critical decision to make. That was a decision uh, about our identity, yes, but also about what we meant for the global climate on a global stage. And uh, I will be completely honest with you that at the time that we first saw these proposals, the time at which we were confronted by the biggest and most politically dangerous 
industries on the planet, the coal industry, the oil industry, the gas industry, I did not think it was possible to win, win even a few of these fights. I did not think that we would be successful. And you know, I, I can now fast forward by 10 years. Here we are, I've lost um, the remainder of my hair at this point, um, but what we have also um, not lost are any of these fights. We have run the tables. Uh, this region has won systematically up and down the coast. We beat back coal, we beat back petrochemicals, oil, gas. There are still a couple that are on the table that have not yet been decided. But overwhelmingly, what's happened in this region has, uh, it astonished me at the beginning and it never fails to astonish me. And it's been my great privilege, my great honor to spend time um, uh, traveling around the re region, both um, in person sometimes and virtually sometimes, uh, as I said, sort of walking among giants and seeing what's possible in Northwest communities um, who say, no, this is not my future, this is not my identity, and we will not allow this to happen in my community and in my region. And, and the consequence of that is that this region has demonstrated conclusively that we do not have to accept the future that is written for us by fossil fuel companies and written for us by industry. We'll write a different future and we will help tell that story to other places in the world um, that are confronted with their own challenges. And with that, I'm gonna stop because I'm so excited to hear the other panelists tonight who have um, much more wisdom than I have to share. Um, so thank you, Barbara, for including me in this, in this program. Well, thanks, Eric, very much for, well, thank you for all your work. And I really appreciate it. I really appreciate your research and I appreciate your constant presence on Locus Focus. And I'm not sure you'll probably be on very soon again. I'm um, happy to do it. Yeah. Uh, I've learned an awful lot actually from working with Eric as I've learned an awful lot from just about everybody that I've been talking to about this over the last, well, I've been working on this now for I guess about 10 years. A lot of people have been working on it a lot longer than that. And actually this struggle to stop fossil fuel proposals in the Northwest goes back almost two decades now. But I think the people that really understand the depth of the battle the most and are in it for a longer haul than us non-Indigenous people can understand are the Indigenous people in the Northwest. So we're gonna talk now, or we're gonna have Jay Julius, who is with the Lummi Nation, talk now about the very long battle that the Lummi Nation has fought against coal and everything else that is trying to destroy our region. But go ahead, Jay. Barbara, thank you. And thank you for your work. Eric, thank you. And thank you to all the panelists. It's, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here on this great day to honor all of our giver of life, the most important giver of life, and that is Earth. And, and really, that's what is at the forefront of every battle I think you witness Indigenous people fight. And I'll speak for myself. Uh, we have a connection. Um, we have not separated. Uh, it is part of who we are in every battle and every fight uh, you witness us fight. Um, Mother Earth has a big part, whether it's her veins, which are the rivers, whether it's the landscape and seascape, everything. We believe Mother Earth has an inherent right, a right more supreme than us to, to breathe freely. And uh, we've done a poor job in the past uh, up until this point of, of allowing her to, to breathe freely. And, but as Eric stated, uh, what we've witnessed, um, hoping maybe a few of them, uh, we would see victories on, we saw much more than that. And it was <clears throat> through uh, coming together with a common purpose and many communities coming together uh, to fight for the future of our, our next generations, to fight for um, our ancestors uh, who made the ultimate sacrifice for us in 1855, entering into a partnership with the United States at, at the, the treaty signing uh, at Mukilteo. Um, this particular picture uh, takes place in a time uh, for me uh, as an elected official in 2012. The largest coal port in North America was being proposed and proposed to be built at Cherry Point, Washington, which in our language uh, is Wachiakin, a village that the old ones and our ancestors called the place of beginning. A place that our chief, our late chief now who passed last year, um, referred to as home of the ancient ones. And while 52 million tons of coal being piled in the background there on the left, that little spit, that's, that's the Lummi Reservation. 
that's a part of the Lummi Reservation. And 52 million tons of coal piled in that particular spot brought many, you know, science proved that there's harm in coal dust, breathing coal dust. There was all of that to factor in. All the 450 plus vessels that would come in and leave and go to China and other places to uh, e export this coal was taken into consideration and was a concern. Vessel traffic for the halibut under the water, the noise under the water, that was all taken into consideration. But the ability to exercise, not just protect, yes, we were protecting, but our ability to exercise what we reserved in our agreement when we came together with the immigrant sovereign, the United States and the Lummi Nation in 1855 is what was at the forefront. And in the end is what was had to be put on, on the line to stop this from being developed. And through this uh, process, I learned a lot from Eric. I learned a lot from others from the scientific perspective and the harms that this would do to us physically. Uh, but for us, the, the, the harm in quantifying the harm that it would have to the tangible, intangible, the spirits of our people, the souls of our people is what we tried to do over a four, four to five year period in telling our story, educating federal officials, the Army Corps, state officials, county officials, it turned into a national for myself, an opportunity to tell our story, to tell the story of the importance and significance of cultural sites, to ask the question, if this was Arlington, if this was your local cemetery, and a developer was looking to propose uh, uh, something that would bring in great jobs and great tax revenue, um, but they would have to bulldoze over crosses and headstones, but an inadvertent discovery plan would be put in place if something was discovered underneath and they would store it at a college. Is that okay with you? So telling our story, sharing with not only the people nationally, but the federal agencies, the state agencies that this view of us still today, right now in 2021, being viewed as less than human is the reality we live in. So when you see indigenous people fighting these fights, there's more to it than meets the eye. There's, there's a lot more. And, um, and, and that's what we went through. And for me, it was a great opportunity to continue my grandfather's legacy as a leader of the Lummi Nation for more than 30 years to tell our story, to protect our reserved rights, to exercise our inherent rights to reef net, to fish, to continue our identity, something that's connected to our identity, to our culture. And like I said, next slide, please. This, this fight to protect, to preserve, and to exercise was not done by one individual. It was done by many. It was done with many other organizations standing with, locking arms with, talking to their senators, Congress, Hearing the story and gaining empathy, gaining an understanding through story that, wow, this is not right. Um, you know, this shouldn't even be proposed. Were this uh, somewhere else, there would be an uproar. And, uh, you know, through this, Eric, I think that all of these victories that we're talking about here tonight, um, we're going to witness uh, some change. And we have the first Native American. Uh, woman leading uh, in, a, in a department in the, in the federal agencies who can bring forward policies. And, and I think there's a lot of hope for the future. Um, and I look forward to the further discussion tonight uh, with these panelists, with yourself, Barbara, and I thank you for this opportunity to share a little bit about our fight to protect Wachiakin from the largest coal port in North America. Heishka. Thanks very much, Jay. I'm very glad that you're here. Well, this struggle, it goes back uh, to the early part of the century. And besides what was going on uh, by the Lummi land for a very long time, two of the other very early projects um, that surprised us when they were brought to the Northwest were the uh, 
many uh, LNG, first there are going to be import terminals and they of course changed to export terminals that were planned for Clatsop County all around Astoria. And the last one that still held on was Oregon LNG, which didn't pull out until 2016. Meanwhile, getting a lot less attention was this massive project for Coos Bay North Bend in Southern Oregon uh, involving Jordan Cove LNG export terminal and this pipeline that was gonna go for like 227 miles called the Pacific Connector Gas Pipeline. And some of the critical people fighting that battle were several tribes in the South, in Northern California and in Southern Oregon. And we have Keila Farrell Smith now, who is a Modoc Klamath Indian and artist who uh, has been involved in the struggle and she'll tell us the point of view from Southern Oregon. Uh, Subgetcha, thank you for the introduction and inviting me to this um, platform tonight, Barbara. Uh, it's nice to be on, um, on the Zoom call with all of you and to share some victories on this Earth Day. Um, so yeah, ma Waklisi Gau says is Kaila Nua Uksuk Inii Nua Modaki. I introduced myself in the Klamath language, um, and actually my name Kaila is um, means the Earthland and creation in our mythology stories. So that's always nice just to mention on this day. Um, yeah, I'm a, a professional artist um, and activist, um, post Standing Rock, you know, land defender, water protector. I embrace um, those those words, those titles, and um, the job that that is. Um, so this is just a, a, one of my paintings. I, I make abstract works. Um, and since, um, yeah, I've joined this fight to, to stop Jordan Cove LNG projects. So, you know, this consists of a very large compressor station in Malin, Oregon, the 230 mile pipeline going through my ancestral homelands. It would have polluted and destroyed or possibly, you know, well, when, uh, there was a leak, it would have, you know, floated to over 500 uh, clean drinking waterways all through Southern Oregon and Northern California. And I've been, you know, joining this fight. There's landowners and property owners that have been fighting this zombie pipeline for 15 years. Um, but for me personally, um, I met, you know, went to the art tent at Standing Rock and met my Saamix Asa right? if you go to the next slide. And Asa and I um, are, um, both Klamath Modoc tribal members and artists. And so we really joined forces and we, I was, you know, part of, uh, my goal was to change the narrative because we were fighting Pembina, a Canadian corporation who was spending almost $10 million a month on propaganda. So it was really a story and art has a really powerful, powerful force in, um, in changing that. So wh whether it was painting signs, doing screen printing, working with Just Seeds, we really engaged on the front lines of this fight. I've been a public speaker um, and yeah, basically, so the last four years since Standing Rock, um, I've now relocated to my ancestral homelands here in, um, in Chiliquin. So I um, just want to give that land acknowledgement and acknowledge, acknowledge my ancestors of the Klamath, Modoc, and Yohuskin people here. And we're a headwaters tribe. And so, um, you know, we, we, we have our sacred place, which is Giwas uh, Crater Lake. And, um, you know, we're fighting a lot of fights. It's water wars down here. It's a drought year. Um, there, I could talk about many issues I've been on on line all day long uh, on many different platforms discussing multiple different issues. But right now I just want to you know celebrate the victory. Um, we were able to stop this pipeline. I have some updates from Rogue Climate and from Allie Rosenbluth. I talked to her right before I came online. She's also very busy uh, today. So yeah, basically, you know, we won. Um, uh, let me pull up my, on, on the last day of Trump's administration on January 19th, um, I'm just going to read it from the Rogue Climate. Um, um, website today, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC upheld the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality's denial of a key permit for the proposed Jordan Cove LNG export terminal and Pacific Connector frat gas pipeline. The Jordan Cove LNG project cannot move forward without a Clean Water Act approval from the state of Oregon. So that was a huge win for us. Um, that was a really exciting um, win to kind of back up basically everybody last March, right when the pandemic hit um, is when the Trump administration's FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission appro uh, approved the pipeline. And so what that means without the state permits, they can't dig anything, they can't dig in the ground. Um, but what that does mean is that um, it, they can take the property of uh, property owners in the line of the pipeline through eminent domain. So the property owners came together and sued FERC. And then following um, that, let me pull up, um, that lawsuit, uh, basically there was a coalition of environmental groups, which included Rogue Climate, um, 
the NRDC are suing, and as well as the Confederate tribes of the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Susla Indians, and Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians. So um, as a board member of Rogue Climate, I was a part of that, and I wrote a letter um, you know, in support and representing 700,000 supporters of Rogue Climate who are against this project. And so on February 19th, we didn't know what to expect. Um, so that was a really exciting um, win with, with the state of Oregon. And so basically Pembina, you know, well, because of the pressure we put on Governor Brown, um, the state of Oregon denied critical permits, including that Clean Water Act and, and including on February 8th, there was another one. Um, it was the, they, they had another massive blow when the US Secretary of Commerce rejected a request to override the state of Oregon's February 2020 denial of the Coastal Zone Management Act. Oh, and I forgot to mention that. So the other, the third part of this project is the huge export terminal at Coos Bay, which would be the largest greenhouse gas emitter in the state of Oregon. So together, all of this, like it's really, really exciting. Um, so that's kind of the update. Ali said, everyone's still suing FERC right now. And so the update from today was that Pembina, the Canadian corporation that owns Jordan Cove projects, um, Pembina asked the DC circuit court today to pause the lawsuit and um, Rogue Climate says, no way, um, um, we can't live under the threat of this pipeline anymore. And so, um, yeah, so that's kind of where we're at. So we're still fighting this in the court. So everybody's still suing FERC. And um, another thing we saw today, which was good news was from Pembina, they, Pembina takes Canadian $1.6 billion right down over Jordan Cove um, projects. So, um, they took Jordan Cove off of their quarterly report to their investors. And so we see that as a really good sign as well. And um, yeah, let's go to the next, what, I have another slide. So yeah, I'll just, my part in it, I'm an artist. I was offered the um, governor's show in the governor's office. And I accepted knowing that I was going to decline it because at that, at that time, Governor Brown was neutral on this issue on the Jordan Cove pipeline, which was fr frustrating for us because, you know, we, you know, she was claiming to be a climate hero. So it took a lot of grassroots organizing. Um, I guess just to talk about the win, you know, like I've been a grassroots organizer, environmental activist since I was like 21 years old, got out of art school in Portland. And, um, you know, it really is incredible to see um, people coming together across differences, across cultural, you know, cultures and lifestyles and even politics um, to come together to protect our, our water and unite. And so like when the DQ meeting was happening, the uh, Department of State lands meetings were happening, like I signed on as a legal intervener right away. Um, and yeah, it's just been really huge, but I denied the governor's art show uh, and wrote um, you know, my letter to the to the Oregonian describing why my, I, I'm a descendant of 1864 Klamath tribal, uh, the, the Klamath um, treaty signers. Um, so that's, you know, part of, of part of my ancestry and um, to fight, protect our treaty rights here in um, Southern Oregon. So that was, you know, it's, it was a part of it, you know, like kind of, I've been using this kind of, the, my platform is like refusal and flight as modes of decolonial as de as decolonization, so I've now you know left Portland and I, I work in my ancestral homelands and work within my tribal community. So this um, photograph is really great. We have the raging grannies in the back. This is <laughs> we were all marched from I can't remember where but it was in Salem to the state capitol, and I'm there. We um, were there with the Klamath Youth Council. So the Klamath Youth Council was there, and we're, we're a part of it. And we were able to talk and you know lobby um, our um, elected officials or those, most of them didn't show up to the Capitol that day. But anyways, this is, and there, uh, there's some of my, my friends in the front there. So yeah, it was just a really exciting victory. And um, yeah, I think there's one more slide. I'll just kind of on Earth Day, this piece is called Undam. And so it's um, the Elwa, Kalalum Elwa. So that's the first one of the first dams that's come down and the salmon have returned, you know, like these rivers restore themselves when they're um, brought back. And so just to kind of mention, um, What's going forward is that, you know, we're working to take the dams down on the Klamath River. We're fighting the drought here. Um, we're fighting for our Chihuahua um, from going extinct. Um, so it's kind of a cattle, irrigators, cattle ranch um, fights down here in Klamath. So anyways, and I do have another topic to talk about if we, if we get to it, um, but thank you for, for the invite um, to participate in this event this evening. Well, thanks for being with us, Kila. And it's wonderful to look at your artwork as usual. Well, going back, we're going to go back now to the beginning of the, uh, the coal fights. The other coal battle besides Cherry Point was in Longview Millennium. And Diane Dick is here from Longview, and she's 
started out, I guess, before Millennium, there was Oregon LNG. So we're going to get a, a long picture from Diane in a, in a few short words, as I understand. Thank you, Barbara. It is really an honor to be here with all, with all of these uh, uh, pa other panelists. Um, the battles we've been fighting have definitely been collaborations, and I've got to know people all around the Pacific Northwest, which has been an absolute delight. Um, I live outside Longview, which is on the Columbia River on the ancestral lands of the Cowlitz people. In my 100-year-old mill-based community, I have often heard the statement that if all these darn environmental regulations had been in place back then, that these mills would not have been built, that the smell of the mills is the smell of money. My response now is maybe so, but maybe the mills would have been built only better. Maybe generations of residents would have breathed cleaner air and would have better health. Maybe we would have more fish in the Columbia River to feed and enrich us. In the last 10 years, we, volunteers, nonprofit environmental organizations and coalitions, and the most important, independent journalists, have defeated five major industrial fuel-based projects in Cowlitz County. Before that, local residents were already fighting expanded gas pipelines through their backyards for the Bradwood Landing over on the Oregon side and Oregon LNG uh, project at, um, at the end of the Columbia River near Astoria at Warrington. I don't know the consequences if these projects had been built. All were opposed because of safety and health risks to the community. However, I can put numbers on how much carbon dioxide from fossil carbon from these projects have been avoided. Um, you have a list here on this slide. Uh, Millennium began in, in approximately 2010, and that was a coal export terminal exporting uh, 44 million metric tons of bituminous uh, powder river basin coal. Uh, convert that carbon, fossil carbon to CO2 and you come up with 64.68 million metric tons. Then along comes in January of 2014, Northwest Innovation Works which wanted to put a 10,000 metric ton a day methanol refinery at the port of Kalama. Um, the production of 3.65 million metric tons of methanol, which was um, feedstock from Canadian fracked gas, if you burned all of that methanol as a fuel, that would uh, produce 5 million metric tons of CO2. I should add that that project, uh, like I say, would used as a feedstock Canadian fracked gas to the tune of 270,000 decatherms of gas per day. If that gas were, um, were, were burned rather than made into methanol, that would um, produce over uh, 5 million metric tons of CO2e. The uh, second, um, Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement done by Department of Ecology analyzed the life cycle emissions uh, from Northwest Innovation Works. And according to that, if you add in the life cycle um, emissions, it could it could produce over six over excuse me over 10 million metric tons of CO2 every year. Uh, that project is basically been denied permits and it's in litigation now with an appeal um, to the state shorelines board. Uh, I don't expect it to hold, um, but we'll see. Uh, then in, two, in uh, 2014, we had a proposal from Haven Energy to export 17, over 17 million barrels per year of propane and butane railed into the port of Longview. That would be the equivalent of about 4.3 million metric tons of CO2. And then the following, Haven Energy was denied by the port. Then we had proposal in 2015 from Waterside Energy. This is this Lou Sumas uh, project. He's still trying to pitch his projects over um, at Port Westward. But that uh, proposal from him in 2015 would have exported over 27 million barrels of propane and butane. Uh, he wanted to refine um, oil, including uh, biodiesel, but if you just include the regular petroleum oil, he would have brought in by rail. 
those uh, projects would have produced uh, 7 million metric tons. Then in 2016, um, we have Pacific Coast Fertilizer saying, of course, that they want to bring a fertilizer plant to Longview. What they don't tell you is that they're going to produce anhydrous ammonia, which is exceedingly risky uh, and dangerous. And even in Canada, they don't put these anywhere near a city. Uh, and the uh, city fathers of Longview decided they would uh, site this inside the city limits next to a residential area. But the anhydrous ammonia is made from, uh, to make anhydrous uh, ammonia, NH3. And that would produce um, about 1 million metric tons of CO2. The, the projects in Cowlitz County would have produced at least 82 million metric tons. Um, I should not forget the rest of Southwest Washington because in Vancouver, Clark County to the south of us, the Tesoro Savage project, which was defeated wanted to rail in uh, 131 million barrels of oil in an oil terminal and that would have produced over 55 million metric tons of CO2, almost as much as the coal terminal. So um, in total in Calus County there would have been at least 82 million metric tons of CO2 from fossil carbon projects and these have all been effectively stopped. Um, this is based on the fossil carbon released if it were all combusted. Um, but fossil carbon is fossil carbon. Once you take it out of the ground, it's going to end up in the atmosphere somewhere. If you compare these numbers with emissions that Washington has reported for the entire state in their latest reporting year, which was 2018, the entire state emitted almost 100 million metric tons. These emissions have been increasing. Um, they have not been decreasing, which is the state goal that was enacted over 10 years ago. So instead of uh, decreasing our emissions, we are increasing them. But thanks to the fact that we have stopped these fossil fuel projects, at least that amount has not doubled, tripled, quadrupled. So stopping these fossil carbon projects has been truly significant in the battle against global warming and climate change. And this does cause me to pause today on Earth Day and celebrate our efforts because you all have made a difference for the health and safety of the citizens of Cowlitz County and definitely for the well-being of the planet. And so I thank you. Thank you, Diane. It's really good to have you here. Well, I was doing this project it started out mainly being about the climate methanol refinery. And in my research about methanol, I learned that the, that the original plans, wasn't the original plans, but the first place where Northwest Innovation Works really focused on building a methanol refinery was in Tacoma, which wasn't surprising from what I knew about Tacoma at the time. But was, what was surprising was this amazing movement that grew out of nowhere, it seemed, and stopped that methanol refinery and just actually then made them focus more on Kalama and now we're finding that that's probably gonna to end too. So it was really amazing to me to get acquainted with this very powerful movement in Tacoma and discover that Tacoma was not just this kind of polluted port place where all kinds of horrible things happen, but was a community of amazing spirited, wonderful people and artists and a lot of vision and a lot of energy. So we're gonna now hear from Claudia Reedner who started, uh, was one of the people who really kicked off the fight to stop methanol in Tacoma and now is left fighting LNG. Thank you, Barbara. I appreciate very much that you have called me on this panel. Um, and I also would like to acknowledge that we here in Tacoma are living on the original homeland of the Puyallup tribe. The Puyallup tribe are called the generous and welcoming people. And we have learned that indeed they're just that. So I would like to show you an original, um, a slide on how, where the Puyallup tribes reservation is. So here we have commencement bay and what you see in, in orange, outlined in orange, that's the original Puyallup tribe reservation. Now this reservation is one of the largest in the Pacific Northwest, but it hardly ever gets mentioned because early on it got checkerboarded and, and, and plots were, were taken or, or, or you know, 
obtained by white people wanting to do business. Actually, to this day, we have Piala people um, like Ramona Bennett, who is a legend around, legend around here, whose own grandparents were murdered so that white people could take over their, their piece of land and, and do business on it. So when you see the orange line, you will notice that to the left of it, there is land that's, that's a little um, paler in color. So that originally was tide flats, meaning it was covered in water twice a day. And the Puyallup have a saying, when the water goes out, the table is set, meaning this particular area, because of the rivers coming down from Mount Rainier, uh, it was extremely fertile. It had a lot of salmon, seafood. And so it was a, it was a very sustainable place to live. But then um, the Army Corps of Engineers and the industry and others decided to take a bunch of very toxic slag, which is the remnant from, from copper smelting, and they dumped it into the bay, they dumped it on top of this, of this estuary so they could build things on top of it. For example, one of the things uh, they, they built on top of it was, was called Oxychem, and Oxychem was um, a, a company that was producing industrial cleaners and chemicals for dry cleaning. And those toxins to this day still remain as a massive plume underneath. And it's a very toxic plume and there's chances that these toxins over time and, and with, with raising waters will break through and, and uh, potentially contaminate the bay and, and cause a, a very uh, serious incident. And exactly on top of this particularly already toxic land, Puget Sound Energy came in and they um, were allowed to build their, their um, liquefied natural gas facility on top of two Superfund sites on this very location. So it's basically what we notice is just historically, it's one injustice built on top of the other, built on top of the other. Puget Sound Energy was allowed to build the entire facility without even as much as a notice of construction permit. And so what's really difficult to, to try to fight back against Puget Sound Energy is that they're basically, it's basically a, a two-headed monster. And this, uh, one part of the monster will, will um, you know, bring political campaign money and they will be very involved. For example, the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency, almost every single board member has, has been taking campaign money from, from Puget Sound Energy over the years. And the previous director of the Clean Air Agency is now actually sitting on the board of, of Puget LNG. So in Tacoma, we have a lot of these political industrial wow. machinations. And so the other part, the other you know, head of Puget Sound Energy, if you will, does a lot of pro promotional um, outreach. So they do in Tacoma in particular, they will do push phone calls, they will, they will promote certain candidates they like, they will send eight, eight page glossy brochures to all the residents, trying to explain that their gas is cleaner and, and that gas from Canada is better. And that what they're really doing is, is they're helping the climate crisis by building more gas infrastructure. And so um, <clears throat> going back a little bit, when we first heard about methanol, it was really a, a big surprise. It was a complete accident that I found out about it. And I actually, I, I'm an artist by background and I'm a gardener and I, I don't really know anything about fossil fuels. When I heard about the world's largest methanol refinery, I, I was pretty much in shock and I walked around shell shock for a little while until I realized I really had to research. And we were really fortunate that we immediately um, found a, a, a strong group of people, very dedicated, and we had some great union organizers that joined our efforts. And so um, we were successful in, in stopping this $3.8 billion world's largest methanol refinery. Uh, but while we were really um, engaged in that fight and, and showed up to every meeting and wrote letters and got engaged with our political officials, um, Puget, Sound LNG, uh, Puget Sound Energy's LNG facility was sneaking in. It was right around the same time. And we just didn't have capacity to, to look at other things and do other things at that time. And so unfortunately, they're, they're already built. And, this week, indeed, the Puyallup tribe is in front of the 
pollution control hearings board um, fighting fighting for their appeal on on this facility. So we don't know where this is going to go. We won't hear um, results of this appeal until the fall. But in the meantime, we've all been um, asking, you know, whoever we can, the city, the port, the clean air agency, and the utilities and transportation commission to put a halt to this facility because Puget Sound Energy already sent the letter saying they want to start up May 1st. May Day, right? May Day. Mm -hmm. So they want to start up May 1st. And we also learned um, that just recently they sent a letter to the city of Tacoma already asking to expand, um, to expand their production, to double their production. So Puget Sound Energy is really clever. They're really savvy and, and they're, they're ruthless in their endeavors. Okay, Claudia, do you want to move to and share some of your other slides? Yes, please move ahead. So this is just another overview of the same bay um, with the, the, which en encompasses the entire uh, Puyallup Reservation. And you'll see all these different spots. And, and this is by no means actually a complete map, but there are a lot of spots on here that indicate toxic sites, polluted sites. There are several uh, super fun sites. And when you look to the to the farthest north, that waterway is called the Hylobus Waterway, unfortunately named after a priest who ran um, indigenous schools. And I'm hoping that this name is um, going to be dropped sometime in the future. So the Hylobus is one of the most um, polluted waterways, and and um, several governmental agencies have done studies on the fish, and they find more cancers and more tumors on fish. In, in this particular body of water. So the LNG sits actually right on top of this hylobos. And besides Oxychem, which I already talked, which sits underneath the LNG facility, just a little bit further down the same street was what used to be called Pensalt. And Pensalt would take the garbage from the Asarco smelter and they figured out that they can take the arsenic, put it in nice little packages, ship it around the world as pesticides and herbicides. So Tacoma for several decades was literally the arsenic kitchen to the world. And that particular pencil site is completely unmitigated. Um, it's hypertoxic and it's again sitting right next to a body of water. So next slide. So what we have learned um, while we here in the community ha have been fighting is that really um, the only way we get this done, the only way to, to get this really accomplished in a good way and in moving forward in a good way is if we all get together. Like, like all of our grievances are deeply, deeply related. Um, issues, issues with, you know, that, that, that the Black community is experiencing here in Tacoma with, with the violence and, and, you know, poverty and being exposed to toxins is directly related to the deep injustices that have been happening to the Puyallup tribe and native peoples. And it's directly related to, um, you know, the climate fight. So all these issues are deeply enmeshed. So now um, all these groups are meeting up and we're organizing events together. And this was an event that we just held um, last Saturday. And as you can see, it was uh, July. <laughs> And um, so we brought messages in, in the background, you see um, the facility, the LNG a gas refinery, who could be producing as many as 500,000 uh, 500, gallons a day of LNG. And so we brought hundreds of messages written by the community and, and we brought them to, to um, the facility. We go down there quite often to um, have events. So I'd, I'd like to thank everybody um, to be here tonight and, and to um, honor Mother Earth. And we heard a little bit earlier on how if you look at Mother Earth and you recognize her as the body that she is, then, then to harm her rivers and to, to you know, brutalize her land, it's, um, it's our mother. We are directly, completely directly linked to it. So everybody go out there, honor Mother Earth. And, and perhaps my last thought would be that all these issues are perhaps just a failure of imagination. So like, it feels easier for people to imagine that, that, that communities will drown, that waters will rise, that the air will be toxic. Already one of four people on the planet breathe toxic air. It seems easier for people to imagine that this is the future than really to imagine that, that we 
can live with less, that we can live without cars, that we can live eating what's grown in our backyard and that we don't have to consume to be happy. And so perhaps if we can, if we can trigger a better imagination and imagination for, it, for a living planet, maybe, maybe that'll get us somewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. It's very good to have you with us. Uh, before we talk to have our last person speak, who is Elijah, I just want to mention, because Kiwi was in a pledge drive, so it's time for a pledge pitch. So I just want to remind you all that you can donate to Kibu by going to kibuo.fm slash give, and you can show your, show your support that way, or you can also donate um, by texting KBOO to 44321. We've entered the modern age with texting. Anyway, our goal for the pledge drive is $60,000, so we really would appreciate it if you can help us get there by becoming a member as soon as you get off this webinar. So what Claudia has been describing in Tacoma is something I think a lot of people in the uh, in the Northwest, we look at Tacoma and go, well, Tacoma has a lot of lessons of what we shouldn't be doing. And Tacoma is a problem. And Tacoma is where all the, the, all the garbage is dumped. Unfortunately, here in Portland, uh, where we think everything's so great, we have our own little mini, we have our own little miniature Tacoma, which is north and northeast, north and northwest Portland, that run along the, the Willamette River and uh, are the kind of the garbage dump for Portland. And I think there's a lot of lessons that Portlanders can learn from what's going on in Tacoma. And there's a group that's been formed called the Brady River Campaign, which is really trying to address these problems. And we have with us Elijah Cetus, who is going to talk about what's happening here in Portland and uh, where we can go from now. And also, uh, Izzy, we can probably leave the slideshow now because we don't have any more slides. So let's just show us all here. So you're on, Elijah. All right, <clears throat> thank you, Barbara, and, and thank you to all the speakers who came before me. Um, as someone younger in this fight, who's only joined in the past couple of years, it's, it's uh, incredibly meaningful to me to be here at this table with you. Um, so I was originally asked to speak not only about the fossil fuel fights that we have here in, in Portland, which is on traditional Chinook lands, um, as well as many other tribes of this area, um, but to also speak about the line three fight. And I was asked by two people in this movement who uh, are very dear to me and who are giants in this movement for me, uh, which is Dan Sears and Kathy Sampson Cruzy. Um, so shout out to them and, and honored to be asked to speak about this. So I recently went um, to, the, to visit line three with a group of um, my close, uh, close family and, and then some comrades and um, as part of a national call out. And we spent a week in the camps and it was a powerful experience. Um, and I've spent a lot of time since then thinking about sort of where our movement is and some of the, the lessons and connections that um, I've learned in this time and that we can learn from, from these fights and from solidarity. Um, since I don't have a slideshow, I wanna just ask all of us to take a minute to picture uh, the tar sands, which is an area, if you don't know, that's um, it's full of swamps and boreal forests. And the tar sands itself, the, or the industrial area, is one of the largest industrial sites on the planet. It's been carved out of these boreal forests um, in an area that is about the size of a small state. Um, and I want you to picture the tar sands and then picture from where you are right now, a line connecting you to the tar sands. Picture all the streams, the forests, the roads, the towns, and think about those places. And then picture a train rolling through that line full of tar sands, crude oil, and picture a pipeline cleared through that land and those waters full of tar sands, crude oil, this toxic explosive substance. So I ask you to do that because I think something that is so, so important in this movement is the connections that we form from the projects themselves. And that actually these projects are the source of our great strength. Um, so I wanna first just say a little bit about the Line 3 fight. So Line 3 has been a multi-year fight like so many here in the Pacific Northwest. It's being led by impacted people and specifically 
the indigenous Dakota and Anishinaabe Ojibwe nations whose sacred lands and waters and, and wild rice is directly threatened by this project. Line three is both a replacement and an expansion project. So it was built originally in the middle of the century um, through Fond du Lac reservation lands and um, other Ojibwe nation lands. And um, it is now being replaced. So, but really that expansion is, or that replacement is an expansion from 370,000 barrels per day capacity to uh, what activists estimate is it will be close to a million barrels per day, um, which is larger than that Keystone XL pipeline. Um, so it's massive. Um, industry is using this ambiguity right now to create an argument about safety and modernization, which I think is something we see here in the Pacific Northwest and we're going to start to see more of in the future. Um, and then finally, there's the argument that they make is that we have a continued dependence on tar sands and that they need to create this, this uh, expansion and modernization because of that dependence. And that's a real fallacy, especially when the United States is a, is a net crude oil exporter. Um, and then we know that's untrue as we move into a new future um, built on clean energy and clean water. Um, but I think we need to think about that because that's going to be the argument um, moving forward. And we already see some of those arguments being echoed here. Um, so the first lesson that, of solidarity and thinking about Line 3 in the Pacific Northwest for me has been that point about the connection um, that we share to the extraction sites um, and to communities all along those routes. So I first entered into the Thin Green Line movement. Um, in 2019, when I moved home to Portland, uh, I'd been living in uh, Squamish Nation territory and uh, so-called BC. And I came down here and was shocked to learn that a crude oil by rail terminal had opened in my neighborhood or just across the river in North Portland. Um, and it had done so, this Zenith Energy Terminal, um, by taking an existing asphalt facility and flipping it to move crude oil. And they did it underneath the ban that Portland has on fossil fuel storage sites, on new fossil fuel storage sites, which came out of this movement. Um, and they did it because they convinced the city and the, the permitters that this was a, a safety and modernization upgrade. Um, and I was really shocked by that. And I was especially shocked by the connection to the tar sands. Like what was tar sands doing in Portland? And the reality is, it was here because in 2018, they could not build the pipelines that the tar sands needed to continue extracting at the scale that, that they needed to. And so this project was just one safety valve that they were kind of opening up. Um, and what we saw was that this Zenith Energy Facility was actually a startup company that was funded by private equity capital by one of the largest private equity companies uh, in the world called Warburg Pincus. And what was Warburg Pincus doing flipping an asphalt facility in Portland? Well, I think when we see that kind of investment and especially from that, that dark side of the financials, the, the private equities, um, what we're seeing is a, is a kind of gamble about the future and about what they can get away with. And they can get away with trying to build these projects if they don't build new ones, but flip existing ones. And I think line three is exactly that case too. So we have to be really, really careful about that. Um, and so that leads me to the second point that I've been thinking about, which is, I think our movement really needs to be stepping forward. And I think we're doing this already to take on existing infrastructure. There are so many pipelines and so many railroad routes that could potentially carry um, fossil fuels or even just fossil derived petrochemicals um, that the fossil fuel industry, I think, is going to use to try and hold on to that profit and to continue to push into our region, um, even after we've won so many, so many victories. Um, so that's something I'm thinking about. And I think we've already seen some of this, especially with rail here in, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, 
So we had the Tesoro Savage oil by rail facility proposed, which would have been the world's largest um, in Vancouver, just across from Portland. And uh, it was defeated because of like really, really amazing organizing. Um, but just after that, that's when the Zenith Energy Terminal opened and Global Partners, another facility on the Columbia River, did a similar thing where they took an existing air, uh, existing rail line connection hub and they flipped it and began moving uh, crude oil. And they still own that facility. They've ceased crude oil, but they could flip it at any point and do it again. Um, yeah, and so then I just, you know, wrapping up, I just think um, I want to urge folks to, to, you know, do solidarity actions locally for line three, um, to reach out to the camps. If you have a, an affinity group or you have friends um, and, you, and you think you might be able to support that way, um, reach out to the GNU Collective to honor the earth, to stop line three. Um, and then I think also to consider, you know, something that I've been thinking about here again locally is that it really has been and, and will be um, in the future the, the tribal people and tribal nations that have been at the heart of this movement in stopping these projects. I know it's true for the, the, um, the Tesoro Savage oil train terminal that it was the tribes on the Columbia River protecting their sovereignty um, to fish at the, at the traditional um, fishing places that really pushed over that fight because it was, they were all at risk at their fishing sites. And I think in the future, that sovereignty, um, as, as Jay and, and Kaila mentioned, that sovereignty is going to be the future of, of really pushing back against some of these existing infrastructure problems that we might see, like, like these rail lines. Um, so that, that gives me a ton of hope. And um, I'm just, yeah, really grateful to be on this panel. And, uh, and, I, and I thank everyone. So. Okay. Thank you, Elijah. I need to do a little bit of a reality check. We are theoretically out of time. I wonder if people have a little bit more time to hang out because I wanted to do some more conversation and, and opportunity for questions. So can people spend another 10, 15 minutes? Okay. And, and you there, maybe somebody uh, can raise their hands. I don't know how, you, how we, I, this is the thing I don't like about Zoom. It's just so hard to communicate with the audience, but I hope you're going to stick around with us. So if anybody has any questions you want to ask, put them into the chat or do a Q&A and we will respond to that. And in the meantime, I have tons of questions. So I'm gonna start with uh, something that Eric said to me on a show a few months ago when we were talking about the, the shift where it looked like these fossil fuel projects are looking like they're about, about to go away. And I asked Eric, well, what should the fossil fuel industry be doing? And Eric, what did you say? Uh, I said they should call their bankruptcy lawyers up and they should start planning for bankruptcy. Um, cause that, cause that's their next, that's their next phase in life is, um, is decommissioning. And, um, you know, they, they can decide whether they want to do that in an orderly kind of way where they preserve their assets and get out, um, with their skin intact or whether they want to be, I mean, you know, the Northwest has demonstrated pretty conclusively that we have the organizing power. Um, we have the leadership, we have a lot of the elements that are capable of going toe to toe with the biggest and, um, most pernicious industries on the planet. And, um, I'd rather not, I'd rather be doing something else rather than fighting these energy companies, but that's the game we're gonna play. And I think it is time now for us to turn um, from fighting new stupid projects that have been brought away, new destructive projects. And we should turn our attention now to the legacy of um, pollution, of racism, of destruction that's happened in this region over the last century and more. And it's time now to start dismantling that stuff. And um, so I, I mean that in a, in a completely, I mean, it's, I, I say it like it's a joke, but I actually mean they should call their bankruptcy lawyers now um, because it is time for us to begin dismantling that legacy, those pipelines, those refineries, those compressor stations, those power plants, um, so that we can make space for a cleaner uh, region and, and ultimately show the way for a cleaner world um, where we can breathe again and where um, there's some hope of a climate stable future for the generations that will come after us. Um, I could rant about that for quite a long time. I'm going to bottle it up though because I know that there's, um, we've only got a few minutes left and, and probably um, some questions coming in. We do have a question. Um, and this is, I guess, directed to Claudia. 
Given that the Tacoma LNG plant is built, what is the prospect of defeating it and what will happen to it? The prospect of defeating it, um, hopefully the appeal will stick. Um, but I think time itself, time itself will wipe out Puget LNG. I mean, maybe even 10 years, five years. I mean, it's not, it's not going to live all that long because they, it's already proven. So they are charging the public 43% of it, but it's already proven that perhaps 1% would be used by the public and perhaps for 10 years. So I don't think that thing is going to stand all that long. Um, and what should happen to it? I mean, lots of options, perhaps a museum or Roller rink, or I, I mean, we have imagination plenty to turn it into something else. And frankly, maybe water storage, because water is going to be our big issue. So it maybe does look, it does look a little bit like the Guggenheim Museum in New York. So there maybe you could go. Be... <laughs> yeah, let's use it as a museum now and as a water tank later. Actually, it kind of reminds me at Hanford, uh, some of the old decommissioned reactors from World War II are now museums, or one of them in particular is a museum. And it's not a museum I really want to go to, but I, I find it interesting. And maybe there are some lessons about how to uh, turn our fossil fuel infrastructure into museums as lessons learned. Uh, but uh, this is a question I think for Jay. To the elders on the panel, on this Earth Day, are you more or less hopeful about our ability to protect Mother Earth now that you were more than you were in 1970 and why? Elder yeah. assumption. Uh oh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I didn't I, speak because I, I I was born in 1975, so that <laughs> must be for no. <laughs> I, I will. I'll, I'll I will take, share. I, Diane's old enough. <laughs> I'll take I, that I one, quickly, Barbara. Wait, what were you going to say? I was wondering what Jay was going to say first. I I I have to hold on to hope. I I I will um, say that uh, my my forefathers, my grandfather, my grandmother, um, and my great grandmother, the, the pillars within our community upbringing left us with hope, left us with teachings that everything has a spirit, uh, including rocks, including the water, including earth over all. And, and I think that through these conversations, and uh, if there's any call to action for the audience and the people is inviting each other back to that um, reality and and one thing that i heard said and you'll hear this often all throughout the co uh, country where proposals are being blocked or um, fossil fuels are being shut down what are we going to do there now it's okay to have nothing there uh, one thing our elders shared with us is when the newcomers arrived here they saw nothing but our reality is for thousands of years two, three, four, 5,000 years uh, BC, we had everything, everything. So um, uh, I, I hold on to hope. And I think all we have is hope. And we are the hope for the future generations and conversations. And I just extend an invite back to not accepting the divorce from the relationship and the spirit of the ultimate giver of life. And that is our mother. Thanks. And Diane is an elder. You're almost as old as I am, so I guess you're an elder. <laughs> no, I'm laughing about Mark on this one, and I would take his reference to elder as an honorific. Um, I was in high school in 1970, so, um, but I can relate that my grandfather at the time would tell me that, and he grew up during the Depression, that at that time you could not find deer in the woods. You had rivers in Ohio that were literally burning. Um, at that time, I personally was fighting the fact that they were, had city buses idling at the town common. This was, it was in New England and the carbon monoxide got to me. Um, we were talking about a time before catalytic converters and seat belts. Um, I know in Longview at that time, I had people telling me because of the aluminum smelter that they literally grew up not knowing that the sky was blue overhead. So in 1970, we began an improvement, but it was focused on air, it was focused on water, and we definitely have made improvements. 
Um, but at that time, we weren't anticipating global warming. Um, when I first started these fights here in Longview 10 years ago, we were focused on safety, health, air pollution, water pollution, explos explosions. Um, the greenhouse gas issue came along a little bit later, and that has come to prominence now because it's going to affect us everywhere. Um, and so I would say that is that is the big change. Uh, I am hopeful. I am hopeful that we can see salmon return to the Columbia River. I think for for our area in particular, we're looking at how we reconcile having clean hydropower with with having salmon in the river, and how do we reconcile having hydropower? Um, and perhaps gas-based backup electricity. I think I'm hopeful that we have the technology. I hope that we have the will to do it. I hope that we have the will to say, um, to say pass the laws in the legislature that will cap um, our greenhouse gases and to, um, to do something significant about reducing it. Because while we have had we have had legislative intent for the last 15 years, it's not going in that direction that we're intending it to. So we definitely Thank you first, Diane. have a lot of work to do, but I am hopeful because and um, yeah, I'm hopeful. Well, I want to turn to Elijah for a moment because I was thinking about what Claudia said about the lack of imagination and that we need to really let our imaginations run free. And I wanted to talk, have you talk, Elijah, about the visioning that the Braided River campaign is doing and how that is a, an opening of our imaginations. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, so I work. Um, with Portland Harbor Community Coalition and, and we formed the Braid River Campaign um, with others um, as a group, but it, we're on uh, the Willamette River in North, North Portland, the North Reach. It's an area that um, our community thinks of as a sacrifice zone. So a place that, um, you know, the, the toxic waste is there. It's a federal Superfund site, one of the most complex, one of the largest in the country. Um, it's got the, the waste storage there, um, you know, the, the, uh, when you flush your toilet, it goes there. When you throw something away, it goes there. Um, and it also has 90% of Oregon's oil and gas stored there at any given time. Um, the Olympic pipeline ends there. There's a pipeline underneath the river that moves jet fuel to our airport. There's an LNG tank there. Um, and there's just hundreds of storage tanks. Um, and it all sits on liquefiable soils. So knowing the Cascadia earthquake is coming, um, that area will just go into the Willamette and it will potentially burn. The river may be burning again, Diane, um, in Portland. Uh, but, uh, you know, and, and it will release toxic fumes, you know, when people could die. So faced with that situation, um, and the fact of the sort of bureaucratization of the Superfund cleanup and how narrow it is in certain ways and um, how hard it's been to get polluters to pay. Um, we've just realized as a group of people and um, you know, by no means are we representing every, everyone in the community or really holding that space, but we just realized that we needed to be bringing together some of these conversations about environmental justice because it's not enough to just clean up the river at certain sites. And, and so we, we wanna talk about a just transition of that fossil fuel storage. Um, the city and state have known for a decade and plus now at this point that it's a huge, huge risk. Um, they even told us it's like whistling past the graveyard. That's what they've been doing, which is kind of a, frankly, an appalling thing to say. Um, but <laughs> But so the question is, why has nothing happened? And we came to the conclusion that it's because there's no vision, there's no imagination, there's no, there's no, people have no idea. It's like Jay was saying, like, after it's gone, what, 
what's there. Um, and we still use fossil fuels, right? And so we're trying to advance um, a future vision through deep community conversations, um, through a lot of learning about the future land and waters um, and, and holding certain things key, which is the, the need to transition those tanks to protect people and the need to create good jobs, um, the need to protect the treaty fishing rights on the Willamette River um, and, and really make sure that um, the, the sovereign nations are there in the redevelopment. Um, and yeah, and to have a full super fund cleanup. Um, but it's, yeah, I mean, it's really hard. And I think Claudia, you've thought about this too with the Port of Tacoma. And, and I know you all are doing this work also. It's really, really hard um, to think about the future. But I think we're just in a time when the world isn't the same as it was even 10 years ago. And we, we just have, have got to, to do it. Um, so we're trying. So yeah, that's that. Uh... Anybody else have anything else they want to add? We're out of time. I feel like I'll jump, real, I'll jump in really quick. Thanks. Um, yeah, just, I mean, I'm not elder stats and I'm not going to claim that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I spent all day, you know, in indigenous led um, organizations or not organizations, but uh, apps like Clubhouse. Um, we've been on other Zoom meetings. And when it comes down to that question, uh, I just want to remind folks in the grassroots organizing movement to be really careful about language that you're using. And the word hope is the last evil in Pandora's box, if you're going back to that humanities. And um, we're using, I used to be a canvasser back in the day, like knocking doors. I've been, yeah, lead field manager in Portland, gone to Jackson Hall all over, but you don't use the word trying either because it's, it's a weak language. So um, I give those tips to you, Elijah. Um, welcome to, to the movement. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I'm not feeling good about this. And the main reason why, and I don't want to go out in a bummer, but, um, and I hope that Barbara Bernstein invites me back to talk on Locus Focus about the um, open pit lithium mine. Um, so I am now switched to moving on to protect Thacker Pass, um, which is a open pit lithium mine threatening the ancestral homelands and spiritual grounds where I grew up going to ceremony with my father, the late Alfred Leo Smith and um, Stanley Smart. And they, you know, my dad fought the freedom of religion case, Native American restoration. Uh, case in the early 90s. So I traveled to DC with my father to do that. Um, but going out to the Sundance and Native American church ceremonies out at Fort McDermott Paiute tribal homelands, this open pit is in their traditional homeland and it, it's, um, it's terrifying. And I have all the fact sheets here, but um, it is what's needed to make, you know, electric cars. I think it's specifically Elon Musk and um, um, yeah, just, it's just billionaires. That's how, that's where we're moving forward with this. So I went out to Thacker Pass Two weeks ago for the prayer run, I'm leaving um, this weekend to go return back um, and be in support of my uncles, Dean Barlis and Myron Smart. Um, and because of the work we've already done so far, um, the Fort McDermott Paiute tribal members have switched their position. Um, they were not consulted. So it's a whole like consultation is not consent. And they're going to be moving forward suing. Um, yeah, uh, about this open pit, this uh, open lithium mine pit. And so just have to think about the rare earth mineral minerals that go into this just transition. And so I've just been spending a lot of time talking with other native people that justice does not mean the sacrifice zones of like the entire <clears throat> Northern Paiute and Western Shoshone nations in their sacred ancestral homelands. And just to remind folks that up in Northern Nevada, it's really close to Oregon, Fort McDermott Paiute tribe is on the border and right across at Disaster Peak, which is in Oregon, or it's really close to Oregon. We have even bigger lithium um, mine deposits in Southern Oregon. So I'm switching very quickly because they're already looking to try to get permits. And I'm pretty scared that they're gonna wanna tap into our watersheds to be able to do this amount of mining. And at the least it would be a 46 year my, uh, mine and it would be 400 feet deep. So it's pretty terrifying stuff here. So I'm switching from fighting pipelines to <laughs> fighting lithium mine pits, but it was a pleasure to be with you all, thanks. And Kayla, I stick around for a few moments after we're over because I want to schedule you to be on Locus Focus to be talking about this. So we'll talk about that when everybody else is gone. Um, there's a, I can't tell if this is from Cabo or from Lester Pogue, but it says, are any of the panelists aware of community building efforts around living with beauty, living with health, like building, okay, community building efforts around living with healthfully in the midst of all this environmental de degradation, especially in communities of color most affected. And that's going to have to be our last question. Does that make sense to anybody? 
I, I think that uh, what I think I sort of trying to say is that how do we in the midst of actually this is a question that Claudia used to ask me a lot a couple of years ago in the midst of all these struggles fighting against fossil fuel how do we stay sane and healthy in our own lives so I'm going to throw that to anybody else and that'll be our last question Diane well Barbara and I both garden a lot so um, I like to get out and dig in the dirt see things growing I grow more flowers um so that's that's how i've stayed sane for the last well supposedly sane for the last 30 years uh, on the issue of uh, burdens on the communities of color uh, i i would like it to say that we had all of these projects in the longview area the Cowlitz county area although we are the ancestral lands of the Cowlitz people and we have um some small communities of color. This community is by and large 80, 90% white Anglo-Saxon. Um, and as a social justice issue, we are talking about low income and the need for jobs. So this, the issues of social justice take on a slightly different tone, you might say, in my community uh, versus say, other communities uh, that have um, more communities of, of color than here. Uh, I'm sorry to say that. I would certainly like to see us become more diverse and we slowly are. And perhaps they are um, just not as visible as the dominant culture here would like us to believe. But um, that has been, that that's an issue we've been fighting here in, in our area. So, um, but I'm hopeful that we are waking everybody up to uh, the needs and um, uh, it's springtime. So yes, we're getting out in the garden and the flowers are blooming and, um, and, and, and being with people of like mind is wonderful for one's sanity. Um, anybody who has tried to fight against the tide all alone knows there is nothing like being uh, with Collab collaborators who um, are swimming along with you. So um, that I truly appreciate and that has kept me, kept me sane also. So I thank you all. Any other thoughts, any, any other ways to say sane? Nature. <laughs> Going on. Yeah, hiking, yeah. listening to music, <laughs> painting. <laughs> yep. Art. I think people who have a hard time making a living, you know, due to poverty and, and racial injustices, if you have to work two jobs, it's a lot harder to also garden or to also do other things. Um, but but just going outside and walking, if there is a little bit of time, walking always helps me a lot. Well, I want to thank everybody. It's been great spending some time with you guys and it's nice seeing you all in one place even if it's on my computer screen <laughs> so i look forward to talking with you all much in the future and hopefully you'll all be on locus focus again and i want to thank everybody all the all the participants who we can't see thanks for you for joining us thanks for your questions and thanks for all the good work that you do guys i have a sense i know some of you who are out there and i know that you're doing really important work so thanks everybody for everything that you do and good thank night. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you. Here's to independent journalists. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to Kabu. <laughs> nice to meet you all. Yes. Nice to meet you too. Happy Earth Day. <laughs> okay. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. So um, let's see. I sort of want to wait to believe. So, Khalil, I want to just sort of schedule with you about. Um,